Oh, okay, cool. Let's see. This is perfect. Um, so the one you're asking about looks like limit as t goes to. This one, right? Let me just t goes to negative three. Got to start bringing glasses and such. Two squared minus nine over two c squared. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I like it. So again, you evaluate. You try to plug it in to see if it's continuous through that point. If you plug it in, you get a value, then you're done. Or you get like 1 over 0 or 0 over 1, something like that, then you're done. You know the answer. Uh, 0 over 0 is where it sucks. So what do you get when you get plug negative 3 in? 0 over 0, I believe, right? 18, 21, negative 20, yes. So you do get the form 0 over 0. That's just the form of it. Never put in your work something like 4 over infinity. That means nothing. How do you plug infinity in when infinity is not a thing? It's a process. Do you understand? Infinity is not a number. You can't plug it in. I remember one semester I had people that just really didn't like that. So I said, do this. 4 over big freaking number. You can plug a big freaking number in there. Sure. You can't can't plug infinity in there. If you can get to infinity and pick it up, come show me. I want to see that shit. Right? That's like powder. Blah, you become energy. Have you ever seen the movie Powder? If you haven't, you should. Um, so what do I do here? What algebraically can I do to try to kill the problem? Yeah, factor the top and bottom. So is the problem remembering how to factor the bottom? Because the top should be easy. Right? It's what I call a fake God problem. Or thank your favorite deity, whatever it is. <laughs> God of coffee. Two plus three, two minus four. So the bottom, you got a two times three, or you can do trial and error. The really funny thing is, do you notice how I'll bet you anything that there's a T and a three in the answer? Because yeah. it's going to have to cancel with one of those. More than likely, it's going to have to cancel with this one, in it? Because what's the problem? What made the top and bottom zero? T plus 3 made the top and bottom 0. So I bet you there's a T plus 3 in the bottom. So look, what does this have to be to make T 2T two, two squared? 2T. Two what does this have to be to make 3? 1. And of course, it's got to be everything's plus 6, 1, 7, kick ass. If you've got a hint in the problem, use it. The more you know, the less you should have to do. Now what happens? If these go away, now you can plug negative 3 in get an actual answer. So if you were to graph this, there would be an open hole with a value equal to what you're going to get when you plug a negative 3 in there. Because this function is this function everywhere except negative 3. So the limit's going to equal what the function wants to be there. If that makes sense. I mean, that's exactly the way to look at this. So when you have polynomial, when you have rational stuff, you factor. When you have radical stuff, you conjugate. When you have separate fractions, you put them together. We'll see some of that today. Anything else, sir? I thought so. Yeah. And then go over there. Can you do the first solution to one? Two point four. Four? Is that the one that's... Oh, that one's not... Trying to get it started. Yeah. On a test, normally just ask the show work. So if you just have the two different fractions, would you be okay with that? How do you mean? Because like um, you don't have any work showing how you got the second fraction. Oh, you mean the the denominator? Yeah. That, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Because I know you're not using a calculator that can do this, or else I'm yanking that sucker out of your hands. Right? I don't think I saw any of those. If you have one, I haven't caught you yet, then. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, so that's function. I mean, that should be, this should be relatively easy for us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, all right. Now, this on one level is frustrating, believe me. I understand. I can tell you my uphill both ways story about that. And remember, I had to prove that 2 plus 2 is 4 in a class. I mean, the higher up you get, the more fundamental theorems you learn, and the more you try to get to know them by applying them to things you already know. Because they should come out with the answer you know it should be. That means you understand the theorem. So here, yeah, you plug a 2 and you get it. You don't just say that and you're done. Because this is all about getting used to epsilon delta. Really easy problem to get used to a really weird idea. That's, that's what's happening. Right? Um, so what's the side work going to be? I mean, what do I want to show? Uh, let's see. So given epsilon greater than 0, we need to find what? Given epsilon greater than 0, we need to find a value for delta. We need to find delta greater than zero such that if x minus what? What's the thing I'm going towards? What's a? Two. Such that when the x's get really close to two, then the function outputs get really close to what hand? That's all this really says. If that really is the limit, that means that as I get closer to x, that's the close, then the outputs get closer to 1 half. That's the close for them. Epsilon and delta, so far, and later they have other meanings too, but they have a, they're the idea of close. Right? The really small pod, really close. So then you do side work, right? We just, I, I don't want to do this whole problem, because that's why I gave it to you. But what's the side work start at? Where does it start? It's really far away from your time. Poor little camera. What the shit are you writing? I don't know. What's the side word? Where do I start for the side word? Where do I start? I start at the end. Right? So what's f of x? 1 over x. Minus 1 half. Less than epsilon. Now you try to do some stuff until you can capture this. That's where I have trouble. With yes, good. I love it. Yes, you should have some trouble. I just want to make sure. How many of you guys have tried this problem yet? Anybody? All right, see? I'm not going to see another damn word. And you're both like, maybe that worked for you. I don't know. But if you haven't tried this problem, try it. And then more of you come with this question, and maybe we'll go a little further. But this at least gets you started. The next steps after this get weird, yes. But I want you to try this out first. So I turn it in and it. If that's the only one you had trouble with, no. Because that is admittedly one of the weirder ones. If you don't put anything down, I'll make you do it. But if you give a valid attempt, and that's the only thing that you missed, I'm going to give you full credit. Does that make sense? I mean, I told you there were a couple that were weird. I'm just trying to push you a little bit. If you have, if none of them are hard except for that one, you're doing great, right? But I want you to try that out first before I talk any more about it. Okay. And then I get stuff like he never finishes his exam. Whatever. And then you have some homework stuff yet? Um, and then I think some of your. On 2.5, this is another question 54. It says something about like, finding the root or something. I was wondering about that. Oh, okay, good. So we still need to talk about intermediate values here. That's one thing I need to finish up from 2.5. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't talked about the, the IBT yet, the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so that's a good segue. Was there a question over here? Did I get you? Yeah, I got you. That's right. Okay. A beautiful segue into that. So the last thing from two five we need to talk about 
is this weird thing called intermediate value theory. Uh, this is, uh, just to let you know, page 122. Now, now that we understand what continuous means, this theorem, when I put it down, at first might be like, what? And then you see it and you're like, well, duh. So let's see if everybody gets to that, that well, duh part today. Um, so given f of x, a continuous function on a so on some interval, it's continuous. Make sure I use the same. Good. Uh, let n be an element of a, b. So let n be in there somewhere. Right? And then I think. Yes, good. Uh, also, know that f of a does not equal f of b. I'm going to draw an example. Is it? Then there exists. You can do it, Jeff. There you go. All right. Is everybody cool so far? So f is continuous on this interval a to b. Outside of the interval, it maybe doesn't exist or it's really funky. But in from a to b, it's nice. Nice, and then it goes ha, and just does whatever the shit it wants to do. Uh, and n is some value between a and b. N is some x value between a and b. The endpoints, the outputs don't match at the endpoints. So f of a does not equal f of b. Then there exists, and the symbol for there exists is a backward z. I don't know if you ever saw that. It's a quick way to say there exists, because math people have to say that a lot. We don't like to write. Or we're lazy, one of those two. There exists a, 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 um, a C such that uh, F of, let me see, better get this the right way around. Oh, sorry. F of A, F of B. N is between the alphas. Easier if I write this, if I put the picture up here. Then there exists a C such that f of C equals n. So here's the idea. I've got a to b. I got some function that's not got the same outputs of both. And it's continuous between the two. So it's just continuous. It doesn't have any jumps. n is in between f of a and f of b. So here n is somewhere in here. Now, with the way I've drawn it, obviously there's a C in A to B. So here's like right here. Where's it equal N? Right there. So that would be C. So all this is saying is if you start here and you go here, you have to take on all the values in between. What's well, the only way you don't have to is if you can jump. But then that's a function that is not continuous. So why did I draw the function like this? Just to give something. But really what it's saying is if you have a continuous function, it doesn't matter which way is which. If it starts here and it goes there, it has to take on all the values in between. So there must be, for some, for some output, there must be an input that gives that to me. It can't jump over any values. Please let that make almost too much sense. Since it's continuous, I'm not allowed to jump over any values. Beautiful. I mean, that's the intermediate value theorem. Now, now, I, I don't know if everybody's to the point yet where it's like, well, of course. There's no, so here's n. So there's n. And if I, if I connect these, can I connect them so I don't go through that? I don't want to. Oh, shit. I mean, at some point, in fact, there could be an infinite number of places. There could be a little sign go, wee. Right? But there's got to be at least one place. That's all it is. But it's so fundamental that we reference it in all these bigger theorems. 
we say according to the Amir value theorem, blah, blah, blah. Yes? N always on the Y? Yes, sorry. N is on the Y. N is in between the two outputs. Then there must be a C, an input, that gives me that output. Okay. I like it. That's, that's it. This is a really good problem. I think I assigned it. There's a monk problem about climbing a mountain. I love the problem. I'm so happy it's in the book. It used to be just something that I'd heard and I told students about. Now it's a problem in the book. I'm like, yes. And you're all like, it sounds great, Jeff. Okay. So that's the last piece of section 2.5. We define con continuity in 2.5, and this is an immediate, simple little thing we can kind of have as a tool, the intermediate value theorem. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so let me see what you guys remember from pre-cal about horizontal asymptotes. Does anyone remember anything about ha horizontal asymptotes? So what? There's three situations you could have. So if I have a rational function, right? Some ratio of polynomials. We're going to kind of expand it to not have to be a polynomial now. We have to. You know, we're above pre-calc. So okay? Um, I want to see if you guys remember the cases and the specific approach behind that that explains why the cases work. So, for example, uh, one, one example of a case would be um, x squared minus 9 over uh, x cubed plus 4x. Sure, I love it. The horizontal asymptotes have to deal with what happens when x gets really big, right? So now we know how we can write this. What we're really investigating then is the limit as x goes to infinity or negative infinity of this thing. That is what it is. And some pre-calc teachers do give this notation just to give you a little preview of calculus, which makes sense. Who remembers this situation? What is that limit going to be? Zero. Why zero? Yes. The bottom gets bigger quicker than the top does. It overwhelms the top. So big number over really, really big number goes to zero. I like it. Now, what's the technical uh, non-shortcut way to do that? You divide top and bottom by the highest power. Do you guess? remember doing that at all. So if I divide the top by x squared, uh, x cubed, there you go, buddy. x cubed. What do I get? I get 1 over x minus 9 over x cubed over 1 plus 4 over x squared. Is that cool? Just divide everything by x cubed. Now if you let x get really big, these go to what? These go to zero. So the top is zero and the bottom is one. Not indeterminate. Yay. So here you get zero. So anytime the top power is bigger, is smaller than the bottom power, it's the bottom overwhelms the top. It's going to go to zero. So it's going to be, you know, this situation. Wow. Something like this. It could be freaky things in there. But at, when x gets really big, it's got to go to zero. That's one possible way it could look. How are we doing so far? Does that sound familiar at all? No? Alright. So you guys are like, keep going. Uh, so another example would be, you know, what if they're uh, the same? So if I have 2x cubed plus 5x minus 7 over 5x squared minus 4x cubed plus 2. So see how the powers, the highest powers are the same, right? Let so me remember the shortcut. What's the what's the horizontal asymptote going to be? Yes, the ratio of the coefficients of the highest degrees, right? 
Why is that? Because again, I divide by x cubed, divide by x cubed, I get 2 plus 5 over x squared minus 7 over x cubed over 5 over x minus 4 plus 2 over x cubed. All this other shit goes to 0, and I'm left with 2 over negative 4, which is the ratio of the highest power coefficients. All right. Now, if this is totally unfamiliar, does what we've done so far make some kind of sense? What's the only time I'm not allowed to do this? When x is, when can I not divide by x cubed? When x is, I can't divide by zero. So if x is zero, I'm not allowed to do this. Well, what is the idea here? I'm letting x get really big. It's nowhere near zero. So I'm allowed to do this all freaking day, in case anybody was worried. Yes? So we should basically just find the x value for the assets of this, right? Y value. This is all about outputs to this, right? I want to know the y value. As the inputs get really big, what are the outputs doing? In this case, they're going to zero. See, look, the inputs, what am I letting them do? Go to infinity. So I know what the inputs are doing. My, I'm curious what the hell the outputs are doing while that's happening. So in this case, it'll be a line at one half. Was it negative? Yes, of course it was negative a half. A line at negative a half. And then your function can do whatever the shit it wants to do, but eventually it's got to approach. I mean, that's one example. It's not what this looks like necessarily. I don't know. But just to remind you guys, it's got to eventually approach that asymptote. Can it cross the asymptote? Of course it can. What do horizontal asymptotes say? You must come close to me and not touch me, you know, at, at when x gets the biggest it could be, right? Which is a weird thing to say, but yeah, I can go through the damn thing as much as I want to, as long as x is not infinity. So what if x is 18 billion to the billionth to the billionth to the billionth power? That's small compared to infinity, so x could get, so it can go through there. I think I'll give you the example where you can have something that oscillates around it and gets tinier. The dampened string, when you pluck a guitar string, thankfully it stops eventually. So we're not walking around going insane. At least not because of the guitar playing forever. We go insane because of contests. Now what's the only other thing I've left out here? If the, so I got the top, the, the bottom is bigger, they're, they're equal. So I left out, top is big. So obviously, you can see if the top gets bigger faster, it overwhelms the bottom, the whole thing goes to infinity. Or negative infinity, right? I'm just gonna figure that out. But here it's gonna be infinity because I divide by x to the fourth, I get 1 minus 7 over x cubed, plus 1 over x to the fourth over, 1 over x plus 2 over x. These all go to 0. It's 1 over 0 is the form of it, so that's positive infinity. And you may remember, it's not just that. You can actually define how it goes to infinity. What's that called? If it's not a horizontal asymptote, it is a... Slant or oblique, depending on your teacher. Right? And you have to do long division. Don't worry about that shit. All right, does this sound at all familiar? Now watch, watch, watch. Uh, I want you guys to realize something. What if I had, instead of uh, a truly rational function, which means polynomial divided by polynomial, what if I had this situation? Can somebody see, uh, I don't know, some teachers call it hand waving, but uh, if I let x get really big, th this shit doesn't mean anything. What's the real degree of the top? Can somebody see that? The degree of the bottom is the first, the degree of the top is not squared because the whole thing is being square rooted, so the degree of the top really is first. 
What's the square root of x squared? x to the first. So this is the situation where both are the same. I should end up with some kind of a number, the ratio of the highest degrees. If you don't believe me, let's do it the technical way. What's the technical way? Well, divide by the highest power you see. Well, the highest power I see is 1. I'm going to divide the top by x, but I can't divide a radical unless the, the I can't divide two radicals unless they have the same root. You guys remember that? A little bit? So I can't divide like square root of x divided by I can't just kill the x's. Is that cool? How do I make the bottom have the same root? Yeah, square root of x squared. That's what x is. Cool. I like it. So then I get on the top, I get square root of 7 minus 4 over x plus 1 over x squared. Is that cool? Divide the x squared in. Over. 1 minus 2 over x. So what happens when x goes to zero, uh, infinity? These go to 0, these go to 0. So what do I get? Where's that? Which is the ratio of the coefficients of the largest degree terms on top of it. So if you don't like the shortcut of realizing, oh, they are really the same degree, then you can do the long way all day long. Nothing wrong with that. So the big mistake people make here is they put 7. There ain't no 7 up there. There's a rad 7 up there. Eh, shit. So don't forget that rad part. So this is a natural extension of what you already did in pre-calculus. It doesn't have to be truly rational. I can just investigate it the same way we did. All right. Is that all right? Is that all right? We'll see what's... Oh. What about this? Let me see if you guys remember this. What's tangent look like? What's tangent look like? What's the graph of tangent looks like? Oh. Yeah. I'd say quickly it looks like a cube, right? Doesn't it? Just a repeated kind of cube. But it lives between what? Each, each. Negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's where the asymptotes are. Because it is sine over cosine, wherever cosine is 0, it's going to have an, an asymptote. Cosine is 0 at the pi over 2s and 3 pi over 2s, all that kind of shit. So there are asymptotes here. Now, it does repeat forever, right? <laughs> Forever. Right. Do you guys remember? So is this is this an invertible function in its entirety? Is this an invertible function? What does it not pass to allow it to be invertible? It does not pass the horizontal line test. First problem in the chapter one review, right? So there's no way to invert this unless I restrict the domain. The, 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 it's hard to say the domain. There it is. I do the same thing with sine and cosine to define their inverses, right? Do you guys, all right, stay with me. Do you guys remember the law of sines? Now, the answer to this question could be a lot of different things, but why did they suck? Especially they suck because you had that one situation that had two possible answers. Because the answer, the output for an inverse sine lives between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Which means you get a reference angle answer. So, but cosine lives between 0 and pi. Inverse cosine, the output is between 0 and pi. Why? Because what does sine look like? What does sine look like? Sweet. What does sine look like? Dude. No. Where's my thought? So is this invertible? Is sine invertible the way it is? It does not pass the. So no, it's not. 
But if I restrict it to be between negative pi over 2 dot and pi over 2 dot, is that inverted? Yes. That's why the output for an inverse sine is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, because that's what I have to make the domain of sine be for it to work. All right. Is all this slowly creeping back? Okay. This question is easy now. Screw this shit. Now it's an invertible. If I restrict it between those two. So what does the inverse look like then? It's just going to be this thing flipped. So what's the limit as x goes to infinity? What's the limit as x goes to infinity then? Yeah, I'm like from my grip. Pi over two. What's the limit as x goes to negative infinity? Negative pi over two. Okay, so inverse stuff, you do have to remember the domains, and they just apply to what the original function looked like and how I had to restrict the domain to make it invertible. Yes? Um, real quick, if you go back to the last one, the, like, there. Yes. If there was a negative in front of the x, so where would that maybe go? Yeah, so the way it is now, it's infinity. If there was a negative here, that would have been negative one, that would have been negative two. I love it. Kick ass. Okay, so this section isn't really like new. We know limits and how they work. And it also builds off of stuff you did in pre-cal. You still are going to get these, these uh, undefined answers, but we know now to say infinity or negative infinity. You just got to stop and think, well, which one is it? You see any other weirdness? Blah, blah. No. No. Oh, here's something weird. This is going to come up a few times this semester where I want to rewrite the problem in a better format. Uh, so the way they give me this problem is... is that... So, so as x goes to 0 from below, e to the 1 over x... Now what does 1, one over x do as x goes to 0 from below? What does 1 over x do as x goes to 0? It goes to negative infinity. So I can rewrite this as, this is the same thing as the limit as t goes to negative infinity of e to the t. I have that flexibility. Well, if x goes to 0 from below, that's the same thing as this thing, let me call it t, going to negative infinity because that's what the hell it does. We're going to do this kind of thing when we get to uh, uh, something called integration and stuff. We might have to change the variable so it makes it easier to look at or let the variable be a limit, stuff like that. So what's this? What happens when you let the power of E get really, really, really big negative? So like E to the negative big freaking number. That would be, how do you, it's a negative power, so what happens? 1 over e to the big freaking number. And what would that be? What's, what? All right. Let me stop for a second. Is everybody, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. But you can't plug infinity in. You just can't. Stop doing it. Right? I really love it when people, like, do this. I'm like, the shit is that? But you can't put infinity in. You can't even get to it to put it in somewhere. So this is like my compromise. If you want to kind of work with it in a way that's allowed, this means the power is getting really big negative. Okay, there's a way to write it. And that would be 1 over that. And what is e to the big freaking number? It itself is an even bigger freaking number, right? So this would be 1 over really big freaking number. And of course that goes to 0. I like it. So did, you really didn't have to do the step in the middle, but it does take away some of the layers of this. You have this shit, which itself is a problem, so you just take a layer away by rewriting it. Do you have to do this? Not all the time. But it is something you can do to make it easier to look at. Okay. 
And don't just say, I know it's the answer because I looked at my calculator. When I graphed it, it did this. That's not good enough. Right? Then a calculator passes, it goes on to get a job as an engineer and has a great life. And you're stuck taking calculus here. Um, blah, 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 blah. I want to make sure I don't miss. Oh, here we go. Now this is an indeterminate form that you don't even realize is indeterminate. And, and real quick word, I want to answer something that happened earlier and just in general. Uh, if you know some calculus, maybe you took it back in high school one time ago, whatever, or you're retaking it, you cannot use things that we haven't proven yet. So derivatives, no. And if you're upset about that, too damn bad. I got Derivatives are a shortcut. You are not allowed to use a shortcut until you understand the process. It is a shortcut for. Okay, math is not a series of just knowing shortcuts. That's no good. If you don't know the process that goes into the shortcut, you can't make connections with other things. You, your foundation is shaky as shit, and I don't want to do that to you. Right? And, there, and then there's something called L'Hopital's rule. That's really going to make some of these limits easier. But we ain't nowhere near being able to use that shit yet. Yeah. Sorry. Later. Not yet. Okay. All right. So what happens when you put infinity in, if you try to let x get really big? Here's the better way to say that. What happens? What's the form of this? What happens here if you let x get really big? What does this go to? Infinity. And what's x go to as x goes to infinity? That's crazy, right? Now you might say that that is zero, but you can't. Infinity does not equal infinity. What? Truth is not truth, oh shit. Um, it's all about the rate at which it goes to infinity. So now watch, if I had, if I had a series of outputs that look like this, two minus one, 10 minus two, 100 minus three, 1,000 minus four, Aren't these both going to infinity? But what's the difference? Is the difference going to zero? What's the difference going to 1, 8, 97, 996? What does it look like the differences are going to? Infinity. Why does it make sense? Because that dude's going to infinity faster than this dude. So this guy's like, oh, you're subtracting from me? I don't care. I'm at a million. You're at seven. Yeah. If this guy was going faster, then it might go to negative infinity. If they're going about the same rate, the answer could be a finite number. So this is an indeterminate form. Shit. So what do I do then? Go to the next problem and hope you don't notice I didn't do this one, Jeff. So what do you do? You realize this is over one. And then you realize, for some reason, me doing that makes it very clear what to do, maybe. Right? What do you do? Conjugate. conjugate. I get a fraction with the radical stuff in it. Conjugate. So what was the conjugate? Is this still going, by the way? Is he taking his union break yet? Let's see. What, what do I multiply by? Top, I get that times that is a whole one of these. The middle terms cancel, that's why it's the conjugate. It's like the difference of squares pair. Minus, see how the problem kind of goes away? All over this business. Now this is easy to see. As x goes to infinity, the top is one, the bottom gets really big because it's Infinity plus infinity, that's freaking infinity. There's no question about that shit. Don't put twice infinity, that's kind of freaky. So this goes to one over big, goes to zero. Kick in the axis. So even if it's not, even if it's not a fraction, 
We all know it is. There's a freaking one under everything. So you can still apply the idea of conjugate if you have radical expressions. So I told you before, zero over zero, infinity over infinity are the most basic indeterminate forms, but there are others that I've erased. Infinity <laughs> minus infinity is indeterminate. Uh, uh, one to the infinity is indeterminate. We're, we're not really close to understanding how to do that one. That would be a problem like the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over x to the x. What happens to the inside as x gets really big? It approaches, the inside approaches what when x gets really big? It approaches 1, because that approaches 0. And then the power gets really, really big. So does the inside ever become 1? No, it never becomes one, but it gets stupid close to one. And what is one to any power? One. And what is anything to a power that's getting really big, like two to the 18 billion, is it infinity? So I've got these competing ideas, right? So normally, I mean, this one specifically is going to agree on a certain value. They're going to both kind of balance each other out. But the answer is not one because the inside never gets to one. So of course the answer is not one. It's all about how quickly is that going to infinity? How quickly is this inside going to one? Whichever rate wins is what the answer is going to be. They're both about the same rate. You end up at a finite kind of compromised number. It's really a cool idea. How do you do this problem? We're not there yet. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. I like it. That's right. It's perfect. We have plenty of time. Um, let me do this. Let me let you guys try out something. Ooh, perfect. It's perfect. You guys try this problem out. Try those two problems out.
find out what are you going to do here? Good, beautiful. You got to remember your properties or logarithms. So this becomes limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of. Natural log is one of those functions that you're allowed to bring the limit in. So what happens in here when x gets really big? It gets really big. So the form of this natural log is infinity. You don't write that down as part of your work, though. Of course, with the natural log of really, really big, it gets. I like it. I like it. It gets really big. So this limit is infinity. Is that decent? Is that right? That wasn't as interesting as it could have been, to be honest. Maybe I'll make another problem that's a little more interesting. Yes? Did you also break it up? The, the, the one that looked like this earlier had a radical in it, so I could use a conjugate idea. Oh, oh, oh. All right, all right. Yes, uh, the natural log of a times b is the natural log of a plus the natural log of b. The natural log of a plus b, uh, there's nothing you can do with that. You said it was depending on the operations, so it was minus, you can separate it. Uh, the natural log of, oh. So yeah, if it's plus, you can put those back together like this. If it's minus, you can put those back together as a over b. And again, Remember the, law, the what is a logarithm fundamentally? What is a logarithm? What does it represent? An exponent. An exponent. So all the properties of logarithms are the properties of exponents. When do I add exponents? When I was multiplying. When I was subtract exponents. When I was dividing. I mean that's all the properties are the properties of powers because they are freaking powers. So of course they have the same properties. You just can't do this way. This doesn't make any sense to do anything with this. Um, what about this guy? What happens to this guy? What you guys? What can you do? take a natural log, because then that changes the problem. You don't have another side to an equation to balance out, so you can't just bring a natural log in out of nowhere. Even if you took a natural log of this, there's not that much you could do with it. Now watch. All right. You ready? One thing you could do, and once I do this, you'll realize why you don't have to do this, but let me just show you. If you let u be e to the x, what is e to the 3x equal to then? u to the third. All right. And what happens when x gets really big? What happens to e to the x? It also gets really big. So I can rewrite this. The limit as u goes to infinity of 7u cubed minus 4 over u cubed plus 2. Now that's easy. And now you see why you don't really have to do this. Because aren't these the same degree? Right? So then this is a leading coefficient ratio. So what do you get? Seven. Seven. Yes, sir. Thank you. But once I did this, did all of you see? And once you see this, do you see how you don't need to do this shit? These are the same degree. That's what I said would happen, isn't it? <laughs> once I do this, you'll see it, and you go, I don't need to do that shit. But you needed to see it so you could see it. You guys with me? Is that a little bit? So what if I would have put a four there? It would go to zero because the bottom would have a higher power, higher degree, so it would go to zero. The bottom would have overwhelmed it. I love it. 
So the ideas you want to pre-cal can be extended to other things, not just polynomial ratios. Okay, maybe, maybe. Um, so what about this here? Let me do this. Let me do this. We've got a plus in that second LN. Otherwise, it's bogus from the beginning. So you can't take natural log with a negative number, so that would have been bogus. It's related to that. But that would be on the bottom for one thing, and there's a natural log out there too, so. Yeah. Well, when x is really, really big, this is way bigger than that. So all I care about is x's that are getting really big. So it doesn't matter what happens when x is finite, to be honest. If x is 1, is this okay? Is this okay? You sure? If x is 1, what are you getting here? Negative three. What's the natural log of negative three? Weird ass complex shit that we haven't even, never even seen before. So that would be something we wouldn't worry about. That, that can't be. We want to have real stuff here, not complex shit. But what's X doing? Getting really big. So is it close to one? No. I don't care what 